Anyway, tonight we're going to talk about meters in the most basic form. And um, they are ubiquitous. They have been around since electronics have been around. Uh, actually, they were discovered way back in the 1500s with things like galvanometers and things like that. But since radio has existed, they've always had meters so that the broadcast engineers could properly maintain and show you what's happening in the transmitter. It was always requirement of the FCC involved, and they are really quite usable tool. Come on. Trying to get this thing to open up properly here so we can continue on. Well, anyway, this is an introductory course, and it really is just designed primarily to give you a basic understanding of what meters can or not do for you, because they do not tell you everything because it's a it's a relative world. So it will be presented strictly from our point of view as amateur radio operators. Uh, for most of you, your first encounter with meters would have been in the technician level courses where you studied for your new license. Now, meters do come in many different flavors, uh, but we will concentrate on the two most common basic ones around, the analog world and the digital world. I was just say the analog world was first around. So you have uh, what? Some may already know about it's the VOM, the volt ohm meter itself, and then the VTVM, which is an analog meter, but it's from the vacuum tube era. Now, today, instead of using tubes, we use things called FETs. Now, FETs are field effect transistors, and they are used in place of tubes because they are a voltage amplifier, as are tubes. So they lend themselves well in our world. Now, in a digital world, our digital meters will always come in various versions, but they all have the same basic units. They are going to be used in half digital units, for example, two and a half digits, three and a half digits, et cetera. So when I say two and a half digits, what you'll get when you turn the meter on, there'll be a leading one followed by two zeros. That's two and a half digits. And then the three and a half, the same thing, a one and three zeros. And they will continue onward and they'll go up. Uh, some of the meters I've worked with in the past will go up to 10 digits. So that gives you a lot of, lot of numbers. Sometimes they're necessary. Most of the time, for most people, they are not. So here are three photos of uh, the meters that we're talking about. The one on the far left, the analog world. That is probably the oldest meter around, the old Simpson 260. A lot of us old timers probably still have one around our toolbox that we use every now and then. Uh, the FET or the field effect transistor type meter. And then of course the DMM. You've probably seen the DMMs at your local uh, uh, Home Depot or Office Depot. No, not Office Depot, the other guy that loads. You'll most likely have seen at least one or two of them versions there. They are readily available and they're quite inexpensive today. Now the VOM, the volt ohm meter, which is let's say the Simpson 260s is a prime example. It is probably the oldest meter that is still in production today. It has a large meter face on it. It's approximately as wide as your hand and white background with black letters. Excellent contrast with a a meter movement itself. And the meter movement will slide across the scale when you apply some kind of voltage to the meter movement itself. Now this one does require one T-sized battery that is only there for the ohm scale only, not for anything else within the meter. So if your battery is dead, the meter is still good for voltages, which is a good thing because that's mostly how most people use them today. But it does require one fuse that protects the meter movement from being blown up if you uh, configure current scales wrong. And uh, also, if you plug the current scale into a voltage without the fuse, it will blow the meter up. And you'll be looking at about a $300 out of pocket expense to get yourself a new used one. Because you don't want to buy a new one. 
not too many people have $600 laying around their back pocket for a brand new meter. But they have all kinds of options. This one in this photo here has a uh, case that's external that you slide the meter into. It will help protect the meter if you happen to do something really nasty, like drop it on the floor and bounce it around a bit. A fake like case just doesn't like that too much. But you can see the scales on it and the meter face there. And you see it is quite readable. Now, the more advanced version of it in the meter face itself, right here, you may or may not see a mirror. Now that mirror will allow you a certain amount of precision there because you can look at the mirror there and see if the meter is seen only as one piece and not as a reflection. And all this way, it removes what they call parallax. So it will give you some accuracy out of it. Uh, the accuracy will all be about plus or minus 10%, but that represents the technology of when it was built. And they haven't changed all that much over the years, except now you can get them in yellow and red. So the uh, FET meter, it's a modern version of the VOM. It does require battery for operation. Now, some require uh, double A's. Uh, most of them will take the standard common garden variety nine, nine volt job and will do everything you need it to do. But you have to have the battery for it to operate. Dead battery, dead meter. Now, the advantage of using the FET amplifier is it has a high input impedance. Now, that high impedance, or Z, when you plug the meter into a circuit, the meter will not load the circuit down. So typically, their impedance range is somewhere around 10 mega ohms or 10 million ohms per volt or higher. Now, the Simpson 260, for example, is only 20,000 ohms per volt. And in today's transistorized circuit, you plug that in there, you are going to get an erroneous signal or the worst thing that could happen, it will swamp out your circuit and it will not work correctly at all. And then you can get the old real cheapies for about five bucks or a thousand dollars per volt. But the only thing they're good for is to tell you if your car battery is dead or not. It's about all they're really good for. You just can't use them to any kind of real circuit work at all because they just will not perform well. And if you're using them on a car that's a modern car with the computers and all in it, it will probably cause you some errors with your car if it's running because it will load the circuit down. So it's not a very popular meter to use today. And that's just the way it is. Now, this slide shows you a interior shot of a meter movement. Now, the meter movement will have a scale and there'll be a meter on there. And you'll notice that the meter itself is bolted down on this little cylinder. This cylinder is actually a iron cylinder. It's sort of like a magnetic uh, thing because there's a coil wrapped around it and there is voltage being passed through the meter circuit through this wire here on this terminal and this terminal here. So as the current's flowing through there, we're inducing a electromagnetic field into the meter movement against the magnet of the iron core itself. And the meter now will deflect based upon how much voltage is actually being seen across a meter movement. And that's what makes the scales come up and do what they're supposed to do. Now, in order to be really usable, the meter has to have a scale in front of it. So on these two terminals, you'll have a circuit external for that that will have a number of uh, resistors on it giving you a scale. And then of course, the meter face itself will have certain scales to represent this. And that's a necessary thing to do for one very simple reason. This meter movement only requires about a microfold to fully deflect. Now, just how usable is that going to be in the modern circuit? Since most circuits are 12 volts, 13 volts, et cetera, or other voltages within the circuit that you're looking at. So you have to have a meter scale so that you can have so many volts on a scale. So your full scale deflection here just shows 15 milliamps. Okay, that's for, uh, that's it, full scale. That's all it can do is an amp meter. So if you pump any more than that in there, the only way you're gonna get around that so that will work properly is to add resistors in series to it 
to pre-scale the meter to the current range that you want. That makes the meter more versatile. If it's just in a panel by itself, usually it's only got one scale and that's all it's used for, just that one scale. So it is usable, however, it's not versatile. That's its downfall as strictly being a meter, a meter mounted device. Now the panels can have scales on them as well, where you flip a knob and it will scale the meter for it. I've worked at equipment where that was what was done in the past, uh, especially in the military at the time when I was in, there were a lot, of, a lot of meters like this in the equipment and you just flip a little switch to get a meter, a meter scale deflection there. It was quite common. So this way you didn't have to have the external sense of toothpicks and walking around finding a bunch of terminals and plugging it into. So this would have been more versatile in that way, but it was not portable away from that equipment. So, but this is really just the basic meter movement that you would find in almost any of the older screen meter uh, type of devices. So that's what they were really good for. And in that context, they are very, uh, very rugged, unless of course you drop it down the side of a mountain, then they're not too rugged, they're gonna break because the case will break as well. So you have to be careful on how you handle it. Now, these things have to be mounted and normally you're gonna run them in one of two ways. You're gonna lay them down flat or you're gonna stand them up. Now, somewhere in the meter face itself where this needle resides, there will be a little thingy attached to this pointer here. And when you set it down, the meter will actually move a bit off of zero. And there's a little screw and you would adjust a little screw to bring this meter back down to zero. Guess what? You stand it up, you're gonna to have to change it again. That reflects the effects of gravity on the meter movement. And that will also help you to maintain a certain level of accuracy within your particular meter. Now, all the old meters uh, have them in them. And in the case of the Simpson 260, you can barely see it, but it's right here in the middle of this meter face. There's a little black screw. And you take a flat bladed screwdriver and you carefully turn it so that the meter that you see here will go back to the zero point. And that's ideally the best way to keep your meter and in a way calibrate it so that your, re your readings will be more accurate because this mechanical movement cannot put your, your volt scales off as much as five volts of an air. And if you're trying to measure 13.8 volts and they're reading 14 volts, 15 volts or 16 volts, well, they're gonna think, well, man, I got a problem. Well, it's not a problem with what you're measuring. It's because your meter is not the way it should be set up. So do be aware that if you do use this type of a meter, you need to be conscious of how you're operating it to make sure that the meter gets reserved. Now the uh, FET meter on the other hand, it is easily settable because there's a procedure to scale it when you turn it on and the meter will be accurate no matter which way you, you orient it. So you just have to be very cognizant of that particular way it's doing things. And that will help keep this meter accurate. Now, this does have uh, the big advantage over the standard 260 in that it does have the parallax mirror scale on it automatically. And it has greater voltage ranges that it can read because it can put more scalers in the circuitry to do the job. And it's a big advantage, it does not load your circuit dial that you are running under test. That's one of its biggest reasons why it's good for using the old fashioned meter like this is that it doesn't load the circuit dial because of your input impedance. And there's also correcting scales over here that if you have to be reading an AC voltage, this will help you uh, correct for errors that you will get. Because primarily this meter is designed that we see here strictly for 60 hertz. However, guys in the audio field can convert these guys so that it can read the AC signal from your audio. So they're trying to use it as a frequency meter. So this will allow you to measure a voltage per frequency and using this scale over here, you can correct for it. Now, 
since most of us aren't audio engineers, this is a feature we most likely would never ever use, but it's there. But again, you probably have to break out the owner's manual to read how to use it. And on some of these booklets, it can be confusing because the print these days, oh, it's about an eight point print. And most people, unless they wear magnifying glasses, will not be able to read this successfully without a hand, a hand micro, uh, you know, microscope or, or magnifying lens or something like that. So you have to be cognizant of that. So when you go to use this guy, you reach over here, you flip the switch, and the meter should go to a preset scale. And it will scale over to zero, and you're ready to roll. That's, that's if you're on ohms. Now, if you're on a regular voltage scale, it, will, it should automatically bring the meter to zero, no matter which way you have it oriented. It should do that. Now, I won't say that they all do it 100%, but I do know most of them will do it. Now, the cheapies, most likely uh, you'll have to recompensate for it because there is a zero on there. You have the zero just right here. So that tells me specifically that this meter would have to be re-zeroed when you change your orientation. But if you don't see the little adjustment screw here, that particular meter will auto zero, which is a good thing. Or the manufacturer will tell you to be operated only in one plane and one plane only. And they will do that sometimes too. So you just have to be cognizant of the tool that you are using. Now, uh, here you'll see there's a little box right here and it's this all of the scales you have for DC volts. And they have the current, the DC current right here. And then you have uh, AC scale over here for reading your AC voltage. And again, be aware, it's primarily designed to work with 60 Hertz or 60 cycles. That's the way they are. Now, more expensive meters, they will do uh, single phase, two phase and three phase readings, but you have to use the meter the right way for it to be accurate. If you don't, they have a nasty habit of releasing them at the uh, magic smoke and you really don't want that to happen. Then of course, the last scale shown here on the bottom right hand side, this is the ohm scale. So you would put the meter over there and when you do that, it should automatically go right over here to the zero point and then you know you're ready to go. And uh, your jacks for your leads, the common lead, then you have a DC lead, you'll have the, a, the AC lead, and uh, you also have the current lead. So you have to be very careful when you plug them in as to which ones you're plugging into or whatever it is you are trying to read. Otherwise, you could have a problem. So. You don't find these meters today as common as they used to be, but again, they're still readily available in, in some areas. I know I've, the one I've got is about 35 years old. Still works like a champ. But comes in handy when I'm doing certain amplifier alignments where I can set it down and just do my readings and it will auto scale for me as well. Now, in the digital meter world, this is where today probably 95% of all meters used are digital and they are gonna give you the scale on your meter, such as this guy here, when you turn them on, you'll get it come up and most meters will show a one here and a digit here as your a decimal point and then two zeros. So this is a two and a half digit meter. So that's typical of what you buy. So if you were to walk down to uh, Home Depot and you go into the electrical section, they'll have one or two manufacturers there with meters available. Uh, those small guys at roughly the, sac the size of a pack of cigarettes. And then they'll have one slightly bigger. Of course, the larger one will probably be like a three and a half or maybe even a four and a half digit device. And that will work more accurately for you for uh, really tighter readings. But for the most part, for most people, the two and a half digit meter will do just fine. You just have to make sure that you do not exceed the maximum voltage that it's rated for. Or again, it will produce the magic smoke. And you really don't want that to happen in any of your meters. For what you do, it, 
it's going to be non-repairable for the most part. So what you will see, uh, again, with the meters, like you say here, from two and a half up to 10 and a half digits, the more digits, the higher accuracy. But downside is they are also, the more accurate they are, the more expensive they are. The uh, 10 and a half digit uh, meters from Fluke and several other companies, you're talking about spending on the used market now, about five grand per. New, they're 125 grand for laboratory grade instruments. So you're gonna pay for what you get. But also these things are virtually indestructible. They, they're auto range, so you don't have to worry about that too much. And they can, they can read up to several thousand volts without too much problem. Uh, I used to work with one that would read 100,000 volts with six digit accuracy. So it was a pretty good meter, but it was also quite pricey. So it was hit, it was always handled with kid gloves because you just don't want to drop the thing on the floor. You do, <laughs> it's gonna cost some money to fix it. So we'll typically see these guys with at least a minimum of 20 meg ohms per ohm, uh, per volt. This way you'll have a higher impedance. So when you plug it in your circuit, you have to remember in your basic theory in the tech class that you plug your meter in, you're actually reading the voltage parallel across the device that you're reading. So if you're reading a voltage drop across the resistor, one lead goes to one side of the, the uh, resistor, the other lead goes to the other side, and the voltage you're reading is in parallel to that resistor. If that uh, impedance was equal to the resistor, what would it do? Well, it would cut your reading in half. So it would change the readings that you're gonna get. So that's why we have to have that higher input impedance so that that 20 mega ohm is virtually not affecting that circuit. Now, if you're trying to read a fraction of an ohm, it could affect the circuit, but not that much. So it was, it's still a relatively accurate no matter how you use it. Uh, they do require a battery, typically a 9 volt battery. Now, the digital meters, they have to convert. So they use uh, an ADC or a DAC. What we're doing is, we're converting analog to digital, which is the ADC. Then we're converting the ADC inside of a chip to a DAC, the digital output. So the digital output will drive the display and, pre and present the digits that you need. So there's a whole bunch of doodads doing their thing inside of one chip. It's just like a microprocessor, if you will. Everything's done inside the chip, does it convert? Or if you own a software-defined radio, you're also doing the same thing. Everything's done by one giant size chip doing a gazillion different jobs. So you're going from an analog world to a digital world back to an analog world. So everything's done as far as processing is concerned in the digital domain. But your input is analog and your output is analog. Even though you may have a digital display, it's still considered to be the analog output from the electronics itself. So typical for DMMs, you're gonna have the common features of volts, ohms, and current. Now, in this particular meter that we have pictured here, here we have a little socket. This little socket will measure on one half of the socket uh, an NPN style transistor. And on the other side, we have the PNP style transistor. And if you follow the little black line over here, it comes up here, if you put your meter knobby right on that guy, it says HFE, what's it telling you? Well, if the transistor is plugged in correctly, it should tell you what HFE is. And that is nothing more than how much current that transistor is, is pumping out that time. In other words, what they're trying to tell you is the gain of the transistor and that it's a work transistor. So, uh, things for transistors like the NPN, the 2N3904, you're looking at an HFE somewhere right around a 100 to about a 200 is a normal range for them transistors, which is good. The higher the number, the better. On the PNP, the HFEs are going to average somewhere right around 280 typically. So that's going to tell you some more about the, the PNP type of transistor. And in theory, that means it should have a higher gain than the NPN. Not always necessarily true. 
because that's going to depend upon how the transistor is actually really configured in the circuit that it's in. And that's the big deal about how our circuits are configured will depend upon how these meters read. So when people go through and they design their circuits, they look at the parameters of the components quite readily. So you got a box of transistors in front of you and you want to know, are they good, bad, or different? So if you have this meter set to that scale and you plug your three leads into the collector, the uh, uh, base, and then the emitter, you plug them in correctly, and the transistor is good, it will read out and give you an HFE, and you can note them all down and you can separate them according to that. So the ones that have a real low HFE, well, they will work. However, not well, but they will still work. It may not work in the circuit that you're designing. So you have to be very careful, but it's still a good transistor. It's not, it's not typically bad. Now, if it reads zero, well, then it's bad. It's just most likely is telling you that the uh, base emitter junction is blown open or that the junction has failed between the base and the collector. It can also mean the collector and the emitter are shorted too, but uh, again, you won't get an HFE reading that's correct. It'll most likely just be zero. So uh, they do tell you a lot of information without a lot of hard work. So if you've got a basket full of these, you know, you buy the bag of transistors through the electronic surplus store and you can test them. And if you get a 50% yield out of that bag of transistors, you come out ahead. And many, many years ago, that's what you had to do when all these surplus stores were available, buy these things in a bag, and voila, you test them out, and voila. Well, we had to do it the old fashioned way of using the old, the old meters and go back and forth between the leads and all to see what the meter was doing and telling it. And that's all you could do is find out, okay, is the transistor good or is it bad? You did not know what the gain of the circuit was. Why? Quite simple. The analog meters couldn't tell you that because the circuits weren't built into the meter to do it. But in the digital world nowadays, for $25 or so, you get a meter like this, you can plug a transistor into it and it tells you all the parameters you want to know. Or in the world I worked in, what you did was you built a, trans a circuit for the transistor where you could measure these parameters by calculating out how to measure them by using resistors certain ways within the circuit. It's a hard way of doing things, but that's the way it used to work. Now with meters like today, you plug them into the little socket, voila, ready to go. It tells you what you need to know in one fell swoop. And that is, believe me, a good thing. It saves you a lot of time and effort, especially if you're working for one of these manufacturers and you're working in the quality control department and you're having to test these guys. You'll have a similar meter set up, you know, most likely a lab grade tool, not, not this little general purpose guy here, but you'll do the same thing. You'll, you'll plug the transistor into the circuit and it will read the circuit and tell you whether the transistor is good and does it meet the design spec that you're testing for. So the design engineers will come up with the spec they want and then people like me will design the test equipment or the setup for how the meters can read them. So you built a little, a little doodad or an adapter, plug the transistor in, voila, you got to read it. The digital world, will do that very well for us at a much lower cost than doing it the old fashioned way. And there is a world of difference, believe me. As we used to say, been there, done that at the t-shirts. Now, uh, there are special meters. Uh, for example, you have RF meters like you have on today's modern trans transceivers. They were never on there uh, 25 years ago, but they're on the modern guys. And you also have LEDs too. Now LEDs can be used as go no go indicators, or they can actually use them like in the audio industry does. They put them on the soundboards as LED displays. They dance up and down with the lights, the green lights, the red lights, and the yellow lights and all there. And that's acting as a meter. It's a fast acting meter. And that's one advantage of the LED circuit for that because it's much faster than the old meter. The meters, have to overcome the inherent resistance of the magnetic circuit response to the voltage being applied or the reluctance of the circuit, if you want, if you will. But you're trying to make, in the audio world, you want to make that meter move as fast as you can and reliable as possible so that uh, 
or high powered instruments today do not overdrive your amplifiers. And that can easily be done today with the greatest of ease with the, with the electronic toys that these musicians have. So you have to be careful on how you set up your soundboards because you can blow a soundboard amplifier very quick if you overdrive it. And they believe it, they don't like being overdriven. So here on this slide, we now are comparing two different types of meters. We have a S meter, which is this guy here in the top. And if you'll notice it, this looks like a lot of modern transceivers will have a meter very similar to this on the, on the front panel. They'll have the S meter up here in the top, and that's telling you the relative RF energy traveling within that signal. Most of the time you see these things on the receiver side, but a simple reason is far easier to scale this meter on the receiver side than trying to do this on the transmitter side. There's also on this scale, just below that scale, something that says PO. Well, that's power out. So here you're, you can look at the power out on there, but do you know which scale is being used on this meter right now? You really don't. So you have to have the push button panel on the radio to tell which one it is. But this power out scale can go up to 250 watts. That's pretty good on the base transmitter. Then you have the SWR. So here you're looking at RF power going out and being reflected back into the transmitter and you're getting an SWR, which is a ratio. It's just a standing wave ratio of, between the output power and what's being reflected back. Ideally, if you lived in a perfect world, that would be one to one. However, typically you're gonna find your reading is gonna be somewhere between the one and the 1 1.5 on a really, 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 really good work and circuit that's well matched between the transmitter and the antenna. Um, modern transceivers, they will take fairly good reflections up to about three. Once you get beyond three, what happens in most of the transceivers today, they will actually start rolling back the output power. So if you were running 100 watts, it will start rolling it back as it sees more and more of the SWR getting higher and higher. It doesn't as a safety reason. This is going to save your transmitter from blowing up. You ever replace a pair of RF finals in a modern transceiver? Like used to say, that it's the Rolls Royce dealer. If you have to ask how much, they wouldn't sell it to you. You blow up a set of these things on a match transistors, you're going to pay dearly for them. So this protection circuit will roll the power back, and it can roll all the way back to zero. And then you'll wonder what's going on. Hopefully by then you haven't blown up the outputs. Um, the first thing to do would be to shut the thing down, disconnect the antenna, and put a dummy load on there, and then see if you have an output. If you do, the transmitter is safe. Then it's, what it's telling you now is that your potential problem is going to be in your RF cable being shorted or the antenna's got a problem. And that's a good thing. So that can, that's telling you that. Now, the next scale down showing is something that says I sub D. That's current in the drivers. The drivers are those output transistors that are combining all their outputs together in parallel to build your overall power, power output signal to your antenna, through your transmission lines out to the antenna. And then you've got other things on here. Um, there's, a, there's a compression uh, signal in here where you can uh, use the adjustment on your microphone to as a compression for your voice. Uh, unfortunately, on most radios, that doesn't work all that well. I remember how problematic it was back when the old uh, 706 was first replaced, we came out on the market and uh, ICOM had problems with that compression circuit not working right. They always sounded real funny. So if you turn the compression on, no matter how you adjusted it, your signal always sounded really, really, really weird. So if you learn, just leave it turned off. Then you have something called ALC. Again, that is used to adjust the modulator in the transmitter so that you don't overdrive the radio. And usually that's set 
in this case here, it's kind of hard to really tell, but normally you're going for somewhere in the middle of the range of this, of this little block here for it to work. Now, if in the digital world today, the word is you have to roll this back almost to zero because you're not using the microphone per se to do your, do your stuff. And in the digital world, if you're doing your data rates fast enough, this thing can be pegged out and you'll overdrive the transmitter and ultimately probably blow the drivers. And then you also have this last little scale here, the VI, the VD. Okay, that's voltage on the driver. So here you can see, in this case here, you have a 46 to a 54 volt range. And that's just telling you that the built-in power supply inside of the radio is delivering that kind of voltage to your drivers. So it can tell you how well your drivers are responding by what's showing there. And that will help you in modulating the power that you use. Because remember the rule says, you only use as much power as you need to make the contact. So they want you to use your power as low as possible. Unfortunately, a lot of people do not today. So in the long term, they end up degrading the uh, drivers. And uh, then you're gonna end up having a very expensive repair bill. And then the bottom set of meters, this is actually taking out a photograph of what was in a tape recorder, stereo tape recorder, as a matter of fact. BU, these BU is basically it's an old term that they use in audio and all, it's just voltage units. How much voltage, but they converted the voltage to a dB scale. And what they were using is a circuit that was reading the voltage of the audio coming out of, or the detector circuit in your radios, and again, in this case here, of your amplifiers in a stereo system, and it will give you a reading and how many dB gain was going through there. Now, this is where the real buggy comes in. Understand that that meter doesn't tell you anything. Why? One, it's not calibrated. So everything that you see there is relative, which means it's sort of near there. But how much near there it is, it doesn't know. It also depends upon how accurate the resistors are that are pre-scaling this thing. If they're 10% resistors, even on a good day, the best reading that can be is plus or minus 10% of that reading. Not a very good thing. But if the meter is calibrated through a known 600 ohm load and then set so that zero VU reads zero, then you've got a meter that's calibrated now. Now you will know more accurately what your dB levels are. So you don't end up blowing up your amplifier or your recorder. And that can happen. I've seen recorders go up in smoke because of that. And here we have a simple VU meter. So here's your meter. And under that meter, there's a small circuit. In this case here, you see we have audio coming in. There's a small filter circuit here. This, this little guy right here, this is keeping the DC circuit voltage from going back into the audio amplifier. So it's acting as a block device. We pass our audio through that into this little amplifier, and we're now amplifying the signal to present an overall good voltage to this little meter reading here. So I have a calibrating resistor in here, so if I properly calibrate this thing with a known calibrated signal at a 600 ohm load right here, this adjustment will be adjusted to read zero here on this meter. So I would adjust it so that my meter reads zero, we now know that that audio circuit is calibrated and the VU readings would be accurate. So we go through there, we now come through another cap. There's a diode here and a diode here. What I'm doing is I'm clipping off the negative portion of the AC signal right from this point here. So on the negative side of that audio AC signal, it sees this point here straight to ground. So it goes to ground, nothing there. So this diode won't react and the meter will read zero. Now, when the AC signal starts going positive, now this diode starts conducting and this one turns off. So now the meter will respond to that. So the question that would be asked is, well, why did we do that? This meter is a DC only meter. So really this voltage is converted from an AC signal to a DC version of it because the meter only reads DC. 
but if you calibrate it right, it will make that conversion the same way. Because remember, RMS voltage is the DC equivalent for DC voltage. So that's making a conversion for us from, from that. And here we have two little capacitors here, they act as filters. What they are removing is any possible RF component here or stray signals from getting into the meter. So these would just act as direct shorts to certain frequencies and just short amounts, the meter will never see them if they actually get through. And then now your meter will deflect. We have a small power supply here for this little 3904 transistor. I have a happy little circuit. Now, uh, in a lot of real cheap radios, like a lot of your CB radios, this would be incorrectly called an S meter. And it will be pretending to be a simple reading meter for RF when it's not designed for that purpose. It's really designed to look at audio signals itself. So be leery of circuits like that. They are not going to be telling you the truth. Again, it's just going to be a relative something or other that they really do not know what's going on. So on this slide, we're now seeing a previous uh, meter face here, and this is an RF power meter circuit. So this is going to respond to RF, but again, it still has that diode in there to convert our RF voltage level to a DC level that this meter will respond to properly. And here's my guy that I use to calibrate that meter with the appropriate calibration signal for this guy, so it will read dB. Now, in this case here, you would have to know what the calibration procedure would be for this particular meter to make it accurate. So there you'd have to go into the service manual to dig it all out to find out, okay, what is my zero point on this meter to be accurate? And they will give you the procedure on how to set it so that it is going to be accurate. And a Cal Lab will then do that calibration procedure, and then they will tag the radio, and they may put it on the face of the radio, or they may just put it on the back, a calibration sticker telling you that that meter's been calibrated, and it will be accurate. So that's a you know fairly nice, decent thing to have in there to do what you're looking for it to do, and this is this will be just fine. Now. In a typical radio today, you have the modern uh, software-defined radio and all. Um, the digital world accuracy will be fairly close to being calibrated. However, again, remember, the attic and the edict is, it's going to be relative. Relative to what? Well, relative to that radio. Because there, again, there's no standard published to tell you what it's accurate to. So just remember, when you look at these meters, what is it indicating? It's indicating something relative. So if I look at this thing, that PO says, I lost my power output, and you adjust it. And if you adjust it here to 100 watts, well, more or less, that's what you're putting up, is 100 watts into 50 ohms. Because the radio is designed to dump its load into 50 ohms. Now, the old tube-based radios, well, if you had the same 100 watts, it would be designed to dump it into a 300 ohm output. That's a big difference between the two. So if you dump this, this uh, modern transistorized radios output designed for 50 ohm into a 300 ohm, you are going to get an error. And it can be significant, but the radio will tolerate it to a point, but beyond that point, it won't, and then it will stop uh, properly operating for you. So again, you have to be very cognizant of what it is really designed for and what you're looking at. A lot of the other information they're given is just general information. So it's not going to tell you a lot of really, um, really super duper aqua type stuff, but it will give you a general indication of what's going on inside that black box. And that's really what you want to know. Is that black box operating? And that's what it's telling you. Yes. Based on what I'm showing you, your, your radio is operating just fine. Should you worry? Not really, because it's working. Are you able to make a contact? Yes. 
Do they complain about your signal having noise on? No? Great, your radio is playing well. That means your radio likes your antenna and the antenna likes your radio. They're playing. Maybe not perfectly, but they're playing with each other. Not a good thing. So most likely the reason why the radio is working well is that your antenna impedance matching device between the radio and the antenna has done a good job of making the radio see 50 ohms and making the antenna see 50 ohms. And the radio thinks, hey, well, it's all hunky dory. We play well. That's what you want. That's the name of the game. So we, uh, we go through all that. So again, we're looking at it. Uh, the true RF meters do work within the transmitter circuitry. Uh, the multi-scale meters do give you a lot of information related to RF. So, and they mean that is we look at it, okay, power out, SWR, ID, ALC scales, they are all related in general to your RF signal. So that's why they put them out there. So you're looking at power out, okay, what's your power out level? Well, what did you set it to? More or less, everything now is related to whatever it is you set it to. So the current that you get is related to the amount of transistor draw of current while you're doing your RF uh, output. So your current will be based upon your power output selected. The ALC again is used to adjust your modulator within parameters so you don't overdrive the drivers and smoke them. And then the VD again in this case here is just the voltage on your drivers. And again, you adjust the power output, therefore the circuitries will adjust the power or the voltage to the amplifier itself to be relative to the power output. This way you keep that transistor happy by feeding it the right amount of voltage to keep it in the range that you want it to play in. And that's the big deal. And then of course, not all these meters are standard. So one manufacturer will have one set of meters that shows you something the other manufacturer has a different meter that shows you something, and the other major manufacturer does the same thing. So they all show you some something on the output. But for the most part, if you can take if you compare all the big big guys together, most of them will all probably tell you more or less the same type of information. And that's really what you want to know. So that's really what you want to see happening on your trans transmitter. You want your transmitter to be happy. Because believe me, if it ain't happy, you ain't going to be happy. It's just the way it's going to be. So now the, the last thing that we are, we're going to take a look at are uh, meters and power supplies here. Uh, because our power supplies come in two basic flavors today. This little guy right here, uh, manufactured by MFJ, is what's called a modern switching supply. What's a switching supply, you say? Very simple, think of it this way. It's a DC to DC converter. That's all it is. Between those two words, to some other garbage. Whole bunch of tinker toys in there that take the first DC, converts it to AC at a high frequency, and then on the output side of it, it converts it back to a DC again. The advantage of running a DC to DC circuit like this is that uh, this is a very small box. It's only uh, just a shade under three pounds, this particular one is. I've got a couple of these guys and I use them and they're very reliable. I've never blown one yet. So knock on wood, but... Um, they work well, they're very stable. As a matter of fact, the one I've got to set up right now, it's running my station 24 seven. I never turn it off. And it runs cool. Never had a problem with it. Um, so you can set it. Now the advantage this particular guy has, the other supplies have other features and all, but you got the two terminals on the front side here, the old bayonet banana plug type jack, or you can unscrew this guy and you can just wrap the wire around it or crimp it terminal lug on it and screw down on there. But on the back side, it will take a pair of Anderson power poles. And that's something that uh, the amateur world has been converting to for the last 30 years. It's not 100% right now, but you still have the option if, you're, if you have converted to them, you can convert everything to the Anderson power pole 
which I've done for my setup because I don't need six feet of power cord laying all over my desktop. So I cut it down to roughly two and a half foot and it works fine between my power supply and my fire base radio. And the adjustment here, the little white line right here, uh, actually in this particular radio, this is a detent too. So when you get there, it's gonna output 13.8 volts. And believe me, if you read it right here at the terminals hooked up to your radio, that's what you're gonna read. And then this uh, current level here is sort of automatically set as a trip point to this level. We figure that if you exceed this amount of current at that voltage there, you're gonna, you're gonna exceed the limits of what this power supply can deliver continuously. So it shuts the power pack down and will give you the fault light. And that's a good thing. So you're protecting the power supply as well. So that's all built into it. That's a lightweight package, really nice. And relatively inexpensive. This particular one, I actually got, I bought two of them. They were refurbs. Hey, for 65 bucks, you can't beat it. Buy it new, it's a little over 100 bucks. On the other hand, you have the big box way from the Wayback Machine here, the old analog supply. This is you have your AC coming in from the wall into a big 60 hertz cycle, uh, 60 hertz uh, transformer. The transformer weighs about 15 pounds. And then it's got the primary side wired for 120, and the secondary side is wired for roughly 20 volts, more or less. And that's to give you the voltage so you can regulate it down through various processes. However, what you see is what you get. Push the button, more red light comes on. Does it tell you anything? No, really. All it tells you is that the red light came on. That's it. Behind here on the back of this guy, there's two terminals. There's one terminal where you can hook up a radio to it. And the other terminal is a big wire that comes out that's approximately three foot long that plugs into the back of the radio. In this case here, this particular power supply, the PS50, was designed for the Kenwood TS440. Matter of fact, the TS440 SAT. And uh, very reliable. I think that, that power supply here is 40 years old, still works. And uh, it's run basically 24 seven. But notice the weight, 16 pounds. That's a lot of weight to lug around and it's heavy. It gets hot because the transformer that's inside of here, it's humming at 60 Hertz, that low frequency does generate a lot of heat within the transformer due to the hysteresis effect of transformers and all that other, all the other stuff that goes on inside of these things. So it generates a lot of heat and it's 16 pounds versus this doodad at approximately three pounds. Quite a bit of difference. So this one's easy to carry if you're going portable in the field somewhere. So why not? Makes it easy. So now just got a little portable grab and go box. My radio sits inside the box. The power supply sits inside the box. A copy of my service manual or operator's manual goes inside the box. My logbook goes in the box. Uh, my uh, jumper cables I need to hook up, hook this guy up between the power supply and the radio, and a jumper cable to go to a patch panel or some such to go to my antenna, and I'm ready to roll. Go so back to my car and away I go with my portable antenna. Easy to carry, try to give you a backache. Okay, so here we've seen basically all you need to know about a power supply. Now, there are power supplies that are dual output. Uh, some have four outputs and stuff like that, but they're basically gonna be one of these two styles. It is the switching supply or the analog uh, supply itself. The analog supply has been around since the electronics came about. Once we moved off of batteries and we went to the wall socket, this type of power supply has been around. So it's had a long run, 100 years or so. And it's proven to be reliable over time, but it is expensive. It's expensive to manufacture. You've got to buy one of these guys. On the used market, this power supply sells for roughly 200 bucks. Brand new, this thing went for almost 300. And that was almost. 40 years ago, that's a lot of money. So our next guy that uses meters, in this case, this particular guy, the antenna analyzer, 
this actually gives you two types of displays. You have a metered display up, display up here, and down here you have a digital display, and it tells you the information in digital terms. So this guy has both types of information centers built into it, and that's a good thing. One very good advantage of this guy, when you are tuning everything up to see what your SWR looks like, you do your tuning job here, and you can watch the tuning meters, meter, meter needles move. Say that 25 times fast. And when they cross, you've got a match. And all you got to do is just figure out what your SWR is based upon where that where the, where the point is that they cross. And that's the quick, quick, dirty way to do it. Now, there are other meter manufacturers out there. The image they offer is one that's uh, fairly inexpensive relative to the big boys' toys. Um, but uh, it's mostly just meters uh, in the digital world. They don't use the cross meters for that. Now, there are power meters or cross needle meters, and they're a very good quick way when, you, when you're using your old manual tuner. That's a very quick way. You just watch the needles where they cross, and voila. You get down to where you get the lowest SWR possible, where it dips, it doesn't come back up, and that tells you what you got. Quick and dirty, it still works well, nothing wrong with it. And me, well, I kind of like to have something like this guy because it tells me a lot of different things. Why? Well, it's just the nature of being an engineer. You just kind of just curious about that kind of stuff. So you've worked in RF long enough and all, especially satellites and all, this stuff comes in handy real quick. So the analyzers, they're gonna be used to tell you something about how your antenna, your coax and all are playing with your transmitter. And that's what they do. That's what they do best. And the one thing with the advantage of the one like we showed here is the fact it gives you a frequency. So when you're turning it up and it drops down, you know what frequency that antenna circuitry is in resonance. So, is that number down here, is that in the band you're playing in? Well, that's a 20 meter band, but are you actually in a 20 meter band that you want to be in? Maybe not. In this case here, I can tell you not because 144,600 is not in your band. That's out of band, way out of band. So that gives it to you quickly. So it could prevent you from making some mistakes. So it's just one of those things. But tells you stuff. So here, one thing it will tell you does tell you the Z of the antenna for the point of interest at, and at resonance. So now when you go back and you readjust your antenna circuitry and you bring it back down where you get it to where you need it to be, in this case here in the 20 meter band, you'll read the number out. It's 14 dot something other that's below 14.4. But you do have an advantage when you are on the, on the air with the modern radios that if you do tune out a band, it will be at you and tell you you're out of band and it will not output transmitter power. It will continue to receive, but there'll be no power output because that shuts the transmitter down. So that's a good thing. But a lot of the old radios, like you got something like one of the old uh, Collins KVM2s, for example, it could easily tune out a band, why? There's nothing to stop it from doing so. So these analyzers would come in very handy there to keep you out of danger of getting a piece of nasty, nasty grand mail about being out of band or something like that. So you just need to get the information from your manufacturer of whichever one of these guys that you have to have in your box and playing with it, what type of impedance that it has to work into to be accurate. And since we are in the modern radio age, we are looking at transmitters that are designed to work into a 50 ohm load. Now the manufacturer specs should tell you that. So carefully read through the manual, what does it tell you? Okay, it says 50 ohms. Okay, so it's into a 50 ohm load, so that's what you're tuning everything for. So you're tuning your transmitter, make sure it's got 50 ohms out, you're presuming that your coax cable between the radio and the antenna has an impedance of 50 ohms. So it should be manufactured into it, unless it's some of that super duper real cheap stuff coming in from offshore that you don't know where it is. 
or you have a line that's 300 ohms, which is going to be the wrong type of line to use anyway for a modern setup. And today's modern antennas, unless you are building a dipole, are all looking to see 50 ohms. So if you build a dipole, it's 300 ohms. So what are you going to do? Well, you just get the thingy that you put on the dipole itself. So it's a 300 ohms at the antenna wire itself. And then the output through a series of coil windings and everything will go down to 50 ohms. And now everybody can be brought into resonance and voila. You've made the transmitter happy, the coax is happy, and the antenna is happy. Uh, and another thing too is um, these things can be used if you're very well versed and use them. They can tell you if your coax is bad. There's also another way real, but you can do it real carefully while you're transmitting. Walk down the cable with your hand around the cable where it gets hot. That's where you got a problem because you should never have a hot cable. But again, that's just one of the little quickie things that you, that you can run into. So for the analyzers to do the voodoo that they do, typically as a rule of thumb, if it's a vertical antenna you're dealing with, you're dealing with uh, a vertical antenna of 50 ohms. That's typical. There's this little side trap on there that is gonna let you adjust to the 50 ohms and that's what they use to set the resonance with for most of them. The dipole, typically you're looking at 300 ohms. Can they be higher? Yes. Can they be tuned out? Yes. So you just have to go through a whole bunch of little things to get it to the point where you need it to be. And that's really where all the work comes into, or the black magic, as we call it. Because generally speaking, if your antenna is not performing, I don't care how good or how expensive that transmitter is, it's not going to do its job well. So you put your money in the quality of the antenna that you're putting up in space to what you want it to do. And that's a good thing. So you take care of all those things. So in this particular case here, the uh, this comet job does a really good job. Um, when I bought mine and I ran through a series of tests where I was working at the time, it's fairly good little meter for the money. So there are others out there that are more pricey. They're also very good, but to me, they're more pricey. And I work at a very strict power point, uh, price point on things. Uh, one of its chief advantages because of the display built into it, it's going to give you impedance graphs and all that will help you see how your antenna is performing across a sweep of band frequencies. And in the RF world, when you're testing uh, RF circuitry and all, you do that to see how well your circuit's performing. You want it to be as flat as possible across the band of interest. If it isn't, you got a problem that you have to look at to figure out how to take care of it. So what we have talked about for the last um, roughly an hour, um, you have viewed that there are many different types of meters that give you information about something in the amateur radio world. Almost all radios have some form of internal metering. And then remember that many of their displays have meters built into them. Now, the thing to realize in today's modern transceiver, the displays are all graphic displays, they're all LCD displays. So that meter you're seeing is a created graphic device. It's not a real meter in the real new generation of radios. Now, some of the older radios when they had two meters in them, they actually fit in the cutout of the display window itself. But you look at the most modern radios within the last five years, virtually all these meters are all graphical meters on that LCD display. But basically, just remember, that display goes up, you're looking at replacing the whole thing. You can't replace just one part of it. So you replace the whole display. How much they're gonna cost? I don't know, but I, I can imagine. So, but the meters and all that they put in the box are really designed to work in the digital world fairly well. And again, just remember, if it doesn't say it's calibrated, it ain't. Unless you know for sure that you had it calibrated and it can give you the certificate of compliance, then you'll know. So then the last thing we got here is this guy here and notice. This 
This whole display here, this is all graphical display, and this is typical of most modern radios today. That panel tells you everything that you need to know. And there's some things here that aren't shown because there's not enough room to cram it all in. So you gotta go push a bunch of buttons along the way to get various other things that aren't displayed. But the big stuff's there. And since this is a software defined radio, it tells you, here's your transmit, uh, lower sideband. And is that lower sideband correct? Well, yeah, because this frequency here also is a good indicator of that, because that's the 40 meter band. That works. This graphic right here shows you that there is a filter profile in there, and it's said it's filter number two. Well, that's a bandpass filter. Here's your time in uh, GMT time, the frequency, of course. And there's a small little meter in here that you have to have a microscope to see what it is half the time. This waterfall display is showing you how your band looks across the uh, needed bandwidth of what this guy's tuned to. So you can see how other adjacent channels are doing. And uh, you're looking at your audio signal here. This is some, some more of your waterfall here. This can show you other, other information about the digital world itself. So here, is, this is typical of what the modern radio displays are giving you. And that's a good thing now, because nowadays with these guys, they're telling you more than ever. You don't have to guess as much. The biggest thing now is which board is it that blows when it goes bad? You don't have the tubes that go troubleshoot anymore or look for the blown filaments. So that's the uh, kind of things that uh, we see in the world today. So this overall course, we. I uh, just presented is basically an introductory. Can this get more in depth? Oh, by far, it can go much more in depth than what I presented. But the original uh, emphasis on this was just to give you a brief overview of what the meters can do or not do for you. Which, as you see, overall, the meters can tell you something about how your radio world is working. And whether it's working good or whether it's working bad, it would be for you to interpolate the data, see, how am I doing? For the most part, if you're getting out okay, it's working okay. That's a good thing. So at this point in time, are there any questions on the materials presented tonight? I have to answer as best as I can. Any uh, questions for, uh, for John? Uh, looks like Glenn raises here. Yeah, John, the first meter you showed us, um, how would that, how would you use that in the shack? But this guy here? No, 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 no. The, the ones you bought at the Home Depot or Lowe's. Or oh, these guys here? Yeah, the, the, the DMM. Okay, the DMM, the digital multimeter. Uh, that can replace all the other guys here. This guy can replace these two. It actually can tell you more. You can actually buy the buy a version of this guy as a kit through one of the suppliers, and uh, you can build one. They're pretty easy to build. Just have to read the instructions carefully, but they tell you everything. I mean, this guy, this guy. What do they tell you? They tell you volts. They can tell you ohms, and they can tell you current. That's primarily what all they can do. This guy can do the same thing here. But now it also has an option right down here in the lower left-hand corner here. It's a little transistor socket. You can plug a transistor in and track a transistor. Now, there are other versions of this DMM that actually will test the transistor even better. And there's also another scale here, right here. There's a little diode there. You go to that scale there and you use your red and black lead. You can test the diode whether it's open or shorted or working normal. Because a shorter diode is not playing and an open diode is not playing. You want one to be shorted in one direction and open in the other direction. So you know you got a good diode. So this guy's good. And the price point is very good because uh, this guy here is uh, under $30. This guy, when it was new, and I don't even think you can buy any of these guys anymore unless you find them online, they're going to be a couple hundred dollars. But this guy new, you're going to be looking at spending about 600 
So if you're a khaki little church mouse like I am, well, you're not going to go spend the money on the 260. I bought my 260 as a surplus uh, through the uh, military when I was in the military. We had a surplus sale and stuff, and I managed to get one dirt cheap. Bought one of these new when I was running a service business, so it was a business expense. But today, you yeah, use these guys. One, it doesn't matter what, what way you do it. As long as you got a good 9 volt battery in it, it's going to play. I can lay it down flat. I can hold it up. I can even put a banjo on the thing and hold it up in the air over, over a hook while I'm trying to measure something with hands off so I can use both hands on the meter leads. That's, that's one of the several ways you can use these guys. It's going to be more accurate. Yeah, I guess my my that's what I should have asked you is is actually um, where when you start testing stuff where you're you know where you're where you're checking it at whether you you're checking it at the end of the antenna the output of the radio that, okay that's, I guess that was the crux okay that's a better question because these are not used for your antennas but if you took one of these things to read across the terminals on the antenna. It's going to read a short, but at RF, it's going to read 50 ohms. So that's two different things. And these meters do not read RF. They're strictly DC ohm meters. So your terminals will read a short on an antenna. That's the thing. Though. That's why you need to use something like the antenna analyzer to read the antenna's performance. Okay. And, that, and that's what makes the difference. As I say, even the price of the analyzers have come down fairly well. I think the cheapest one that MFJ sells nowadays, it, it does work. It's touchy, but it does work. I think it's down around $100 price point now. The, the bigger one of theirs is still right around 200 The only downside with them I've ever experienced is uh, you got to be very careful when you hook them up. They have four little teeny tiny signal diodes in there. And they'll blow if you look at them cross-eyed. Sorry to say that, but they just do that. And that's just uh, one of the things they do. It's unfortunate, but they do do that. I've had one blow, and I sent it back to MFJ, and they said, well, you shouldn't have had it hooked up to a transmitter. I said, it wasn't hooked to a transmitter. It was sitting on top of a truck. I just put it up there in the truck, and I wanted to adjust the antenna before I ever hooked anything up to it. But it blew them. Static electricity. That's all I can say. Best I know. So that's uh, the thing to have. So if you're doing general electronics type stuff, that feeder, that little guy there, you can get the Lowe's or Home Depot, whatever, the ones they sell. Uh, they can be good for measuring your DC voltages, measuring your AC coming out of the wall socket. They can check your fuses. They can even read your impedances to some extent, but just understand the impedances that it's reading, you, reading for you are going to be in ohms. The Z is always read in ohms. However, if you try that on an antenna terminal itself, it's going to read zero. That's not telling you anything. You can say, oh, my antenna's bad. I need a new one. No, because the antenna requires RF to see the impedance it wants to see. So you got to know which form of voodoo that you got to do to, to make it do what it's got to do. Okay, okay. Well, thank you for answering my question, and, and um, I would like to tell you a great job tonight. Nice thank presentation. You. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I see another hand up there. John. Uh, don't hear him. Sounds like he's, I think he's muted. How about now? Perfect. All right. Yeah, John, great presentation. Thank you. Like, you like the question, what do you use it for in the shack? Well, kind of just basic troubleshooting. One of those really cheap meters, just when you put the connectors on your coax, make sure you don't have a short. There's like a, a, mil a million little things or troubleshooting yeah. a, a piece of equipment. The real simple way is, hey, I have power here. You know, where does the power stop coming? You know, as far as a power supply or something. And yeah, I, I bought a $30 one at, uh, from our friends in China at Harbor Freight, and that one will even uh, measure capacitance, which uh, I've used yes. quite a few times, and that was pretty cool. There's, a, there's also another version they have that also does not only capacitance, but also measures inductors. Yeah. But yeah, like just like 
you know, it kind of sounds silly, but the, the most basic troubleshooting is, hey, I just put these connectors on. <laughs> Did I do a good job or do I have a short? And that could be Absolutely. whether it's a power connector or, you know, uh, PL259 or whatnot. But yeah, yeah great, could... great presentation, John. Well, thank you, John. As I say, I could always recommend a time domain reflectometer. That's a particular toy. That'll tell you everything, too. But we don't carry that around the back pocket. So, but yeah, you're right. It's a good point that you could use that to measure your solder jobs because unless you've done a bunch of the coax connectors, they can be problematic at times, especially in connectors. If you do not assemble them correctly, they will not work because I can tell you from experience that if you don't bend the, the grating correctly inside that connector right, you screw everything down, guess what? Coax will fall right out because you cut it in half because you assembled it backwards. Why? I know from experience because I've done it more than once. And I did it one time in the rain because I had a broken antenna on top of a transceiver site. And I had to repair a connector real fast. I was doing it too fast, not paying any attention to what I was doing. So I had to build that thing a second time. So yes, it's easy to do. But the standard 239 is fairly simple to cut up the right way. What I found is that works is strip the outside shielding off. Make sure you've got your braiding nice and clear. Solder, pin it first. And then you can take a piece, one of the little uh, pipe cutters, go back on it, and then run it around the ring there, cut off the excess braiding, pull it off, slide it into the barrel, and you can slide, you can slide it to the barrel, the greatest of ease, and never have a problem. Uh, it's fun. That's one way to work. And then you can check your job as to how well you did. So, anyway, uh, any any other questions? So I guess if there are no other questions, then I, I guess that's it for the night. Thank you all for attending, and I hope this was helpful. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys again on another presentation.